these magnificent peaks in the mountains of northern Italy, these green slopes, witnessed one of history's cruelest and most tragic acts of religious intolerance, the slaughter of the Waldensians. It was the last sad gasp of the Dark Ages. And what seems especially incomprehensible is the man who led the persecution, King Louis XIV of France. The reign of Louis XIV centered at the Palace of Versailles. It became synonymous with luxury and decadence. The Sun King of France spared no expense in making his gardens the most splendid in the world. Life at Versailles was about the extravagant pursuit of pleasure. Lavish operas and plays were staged there. People gambled like madmen and there was always a feast going on. A lady at the court declared that if she ate half as much as Louis, she would be dead within a week. The king also played with a succession of mistresses. And yet it was this Louis, a man who cared little about religious controversies, who took it upon himself to send soldiers into the last mountain hideouts of the Waldenses to crush the heretics. What could possibly have motivated him? The answer is a fascinating story about a quest for a mediator in our lives who cannot be manipulated. It has stood the test of time. God's Book, the Bible. Still relevant in today's complex world. It is written. Sharing hope around the globe. Presented by Mark Finley. A mediator we can't manipulate. On Good Friday, 1686, the Waldensian people of these valleys gathered in the church of Angragna. They knew that the soldiers were coming. Pastor Henry Arnaud prayed, Lord Jesus, you have suffered and died for us. Give us grace to suffer and die for you. And all the congregation answered, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. At Easter, so many came to share in the Lord's Supper at the Waldensian churches that in several places it had to be held in the open air. For many, it was their last communion with Christ on earth. And then at the first break of day on April 22nd, three cannon shots echoed out over a hilltop. It was the signal for two armies, one French, one Savoy, to move in. Some Waldenses tried to defend themselves Others, like the people of the Valley of St. Martin, declared they would accept an earlier offer of exile. The Savoy troops cut them in pieces anyway. In the town of St. Germain, the French general, Catena, offered pardon to all who surrendered. At length, he persuaded the Waldenses to let his soldiers in. They proceeded to brutalize and massacre men, women, and children. Why were the Waldenses the objects of such hatred? What terrible crimes had they committed? Their crime was what they taught in chapels like this one hidden away in the mountains. They preached beliefs that just didn't conform to the established church's position. And they had stubbornly resisted the pressure of the Church of Rome for centuries. One of the reasons why they were regarded as heretics is found 
in their confession of faith. Let me read you an article from a confession of faith of the Waldenses, which goes all the way back to 1120. Christ is our life, truth, peace, and righteousness. Also our pastor, advocate, sacrifice, and priest, who died for the salvation of all those that believe and is risen for our justification. In like manner, we firmly hold that there is no other mediator and advocate with God the Father save only Jesus Christ. The Waldenses base their confession on the clear statements of the New Testament. Paul's statement to Timothy, for example, found in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verses 5 and 6. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. That text was probably read right here in this chapel and they tried to live out the implications of that principle. They also read statements in the book of Hebrews about how Christ is our one and only high priest in heaven. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 10 and verses 12 and 14. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Christ's sacrifice is the one thing we need in order to come boldly before a holy God. That's what the Waldenses read in their Bibles. And that's what they proclaimed. They had a very strong picture of Jesus as Savior, as High Priest, as Mediator in Heaven. And they denied there was any other mediator between God and human beings. What's so terrible about that, you may ask? Why was this regarded as dangerous heresy? This is the Cathedral of Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome. Pilgrims have come here for centuries to honor the Mother of Christ and to plead for her intercession. In the Middle Ages, Mary, the peasant girl from Nazareth, was given greater honor than ever before. The Council of Ephesus made it official. The Virgin Mary was to be venerated as the Mother of God. Pope Sixtus III decided to build this basilica in her honor. The spot he selected, interestingly enough, was the Escoline Hill, where a cult of the ancient Roman mother goddess, you know, Lucina, had been based. The fact is, the Church of Rome had multiplied mediators and profited greatly from it. Besides Mary, there were all the saints reigning with Christ in heaven. Sincere worshipers prayed to them, performed acts of devotion to them, in the hope of gaining favor with God. And the local priest also served as a mediator. He could hear confessions and assign penances and grant pardons. When the Waldenses declared that Jesus is our one and only mediator, they were tearing at the foundations of this huge religious bureaucracy. They were challenging the system that led from local priest to sympathetic saint, to glorified virgin, to God and the Church of Rome needed to keep that system intact. That's why the Waldenses were condemned and harassed and brought before the Inquisition. That's why they were slaughtered as dangerous heretics in 1686. But how did Louis XIV get into the act? He seems the most unlikely defender of the faith. Louis was not personally troubled by heresies of any kind. Like most people who have little interest in religion, he could be tolerant. In fact, he once said, just as green leaves of trees differ subtly in color, so God has given man religions of slightly different hues. But something radically changed this king's attitude. Essentially, it boils down to this. Louis XIV wanted to impress the man who ruled from St. Peter's Basilica here in Rome. It started with a priest named Letelier. He was Louis' confessor at court. This priest became very ill. 
and began preparing himself for death. In the process, he had heart-to-heart -heart talks with Louis. He told the king that he could atone for all his personal faults, for his life of selfish indulgence by dealing once and for all with those pesky Protestants. While Louis was feeling a little vulnerable, his latest affair with a married woman had heightened his anxiety about salvation. Letelier persuaded him that exterminating heretics would make him the champion of the papacy and assure him a place in heaven. And so Louis XIV, that paragon of self-gratification, sent troops out to crush the doctrinally correct. He began persecuting the Huguenot Protestants in his own country. As a result, thousands fled and France lost many of its brightest and best. Louis also sent stern messages to Victor Amadeus II, the Duke of Savoy. He demanded the Duke drive out the Waldenses from the mountains of Italy. At first, the Duke resisted this invasion into the affairs of Savoy, but Louis kept pressuring him. He threatened to annex Savoy to France if necessary. So Victor Amadeus II finally agreed to strike a blow on behalf of the church in Rome and destroy these heretics. The tragic fact is that the blood of the Waldensian men, women, and children flowed on these mountain trails because one man wanted to appease the Pope. Louis XIV wanted to bargain with God. He didn't want to come before God face to face with his track record of immorality. He didn't want to honestly confess his selfish lifestyle to the Almighty. So he tried going through a third party, a human third party. He tried to cover up his sins by earning approval from a human mediator. Instead of turning from evil, he punished heretics. And the result was the most devastating persecution the Waldenses ever suffered. They had endured centuries of harassment and still clung tightly to their faith. But this time, in 1686, they were almost totally wiped out. Brave Waldensian believers were burned alive. They were cut open. They were thrown from cliffs. They were used as target practice by soldiers. After three days of slaughter, the only reminders of life in many of these valleys were the corpses left hanging from trees. There's a reason why the apostles tell us there is one mediator between us and God. There's an important reason. We need a mediator we can't manipulate. In the first chapters of Revelation, the glorified Christ, the Christ who serves as high priest in heaven makes an appearance. He is covered in a dazzling white garment and his eyes seem like flames of fire. This is what he says in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 23. And all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Jesus Christ is someone we can't manipulate. We can't play games with him. He sees everything. He sees into our inmost being. He treats us fairly. Salvation can't be bought with penances, indulgences, or our good works. But human beings in our weakness are always trying to put something else between us and God. We want another buffer. We want something we can hide behind. And unfortunately, the Church of Rome created a whole system which sinful people found it all too easy to manipulate. You could lie to a priest. You could paper over sin with indulgences. You could imagine a sympathetic saint for every occasion, every need. You could try to extract favors from Mary. Surely she would understand human frailty when it appeared the holy God could not. This is the Basilica de Superga, which overlooks the city of Turin, close to the Italian Alps, once the domain of the Dukes of Savoy. The story of how this basilica was built shows us how people tend to create mediators in their own image. A few decades after the Waldensian massacre, Louis XIV decided to take control of the Savoy from Victor Amadeus, the very man who'd obediently slaughtered heretics for him. French troops laid siege to the city of Turin in 1705. 
almost all the other Savoy fortresses had been overrun. Victor Amadeus, however, managed to escape. He began gathering troops to break the siege. For three long months, the city withstood bombardment. On September 2, 1706, Victor managed to climb this hill and check out French positions around the city walls. Two days later, he sent Savoy troops against the French at their weakest point. Inexplicably, the vast French army failed to counterattack. Victor led a cavalry charge and broke through their lines. The French soldiers panicked and fled. As Victor Amadeus rode into Turin, as the great liberator, he could hear the music of a Thanksgiving mass sung in the city's great cathedral. It was September the 8th, the same day as the Feast of the Virgin's Nativity. Victor proclaimed that divine favor had saved his capital, and a grateful population poured out their devotion on the Virgin Mary. This beautiful basilica was built here in fulfillment of a vow made to her. The people of Turin came here to pay tribute to the lady who broke the siege. Now, as a matter of fact, Louis XIV had decided to abandon the Savoy in 1706 and pull his troops out. Another army, that of the Habsburgs, was on the march, and he had to face this new threat. All that had a great deal to do with why Turin didn't fall to the French. But the citizens of this city wanted to believe that the Virgin Mary was on their side. Victor Amadeus wanted to believe that he had somehow earned favor from the mother of Jesus. He didn't want to think about the blood of the Waldensian men, women, and children on his hands. He didn't want to believe that blood was crying out to the Almighty. Neither did any of his soldiers who'd taken part in the massacre. They wanted someone in heaven who approved their cause, who waved their flag, who cheered for Turin. Mediators we help create are mediators we can manipulate. Mediators we make up are mediators who will always say we're right and the other person wrong. Jesus Christ is the mediator who helps us in a different way. He helps us by always telling us the truth. He helps us be honest about ourselves. Listen to how the book of Hebrews describes him in chapter 4 and verses 15 and 16. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus Christ, taking on human flesh, understands what we go through. He endured our worst trials and temptations. But he doesn't use that to excuse our moral failures. He doesn't encourage denial. He inspires us to struggle. He doesn't help us hide our addictions. He says, this is how you can overcome sin. He says, this is where you can find help. This is where you can find grace and mercy. Having Jesus as our one and only mediator is about facing life. Every other mediator is a way for us to avoid life in some way avoid truth in some way. In the end, every other mediator will fail us. The irony of history is this. Louis XIV never really received the papal favors he hoped to gain by destroying the Waldenses. The fact is, something had already happened in the Vatican. The tide of opinion was turning against the use of violence on Protestants. Victor Amadeus didn't get much thanks either. He tried to ingratiate himself with Pope Innocent XI by claiming that the slaughter had come from his own zeal for the faith. Innocent sent a message of congratulations. It wasn't very enthusiastic. Louis and Victor had carried out a ghastly act of intolerance that belonged to the worst of the Dark Ages. It was its final horrible gasp. Louis had set back any hopes of reconciliation between Protestants and Catholics in his country for centuries. Victor had lost most of his kingdom, and there was no papal blessing to wash the blood from their hands. Human mediators are fickle that way. Only Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. When it comes to a mediator in my life, I'd rather stand with the Waldenses who endured so much in these valleys 
I'd rather echo their faith. During those three terrible days of slaughter here, there were a few hours of quiet, usually during the dead of night. Fires were kindled by the Waldenses and the soldiers to keep warm by. The soldiers warming their hands at the flames boasted of the people they had killed that day. Around other fires in the forest, the Waldenses were doing something quite different. They'd agreed on a prayer they would say together. And so around their little fires in the midst of the mountains, they raised their voices together and prayed, O Lord, our great God and the Father of mercy, we humble ourselves before thy face to implore of thee pardon of all of our sins in the name of Jesus Christ our Savior. We render unto thee also our thanksgivings that it hath pleased thee to preserve us. And if any of us shall die in this cause, receive him, O Lord, in thy grace. These were the words they said before catching a few hours of sleep. These were the words they said after waking in the morning. Their faith was focused on the Christ who stood with them as the righteous Lord, and it was this that enabled them to face life and death with remarkable courage. They weren't hiding. They weren't making excuses. They were creating a light that would shine down through the centuries right to us, a light that shines on Christ as our wise and merciful mediator. A Waldensian pastor named Lede managed to escape to a cave, but he was captured when soldiers heard him singing hymns in a low voice. He was taken to prison, placed in stocks, and interrogated for days. Priests tried and failed to get him back to the mother church. At length, they told him, you're going to die. Lede replied quietly, the will of God be done. They gave him one more chance. You may save your life by recanting. That would not be the will of God, the pastor replied. As the hour of execution drew near, some monks tried a few final arguments, hoping to work in his frayed nerves. He remained calm, even serene. On the way to the place of death, he said to the executioners, this for me is a day of double deliverance in which both my soul and my body ought to rejoice. After mounting the scaffold, he said, My God, I commit my life into your hands. There was nothing between this man and God, nothing but Jesus. That's why he could look the worst in the face and never blink. You know, it's our human weakness that puts up buffers between us and God. We instinctively reach for something to hide behind. But the truth is, our human weakness requires that we have no other mediator but Christ. We create other mediators at our own peril. They can't deliver. They'll let us down. And in the end, we'll have no way of standing before a holy God. I invite you to come to Jesus Christ right now. I invite you to come on his terms. Come as you are, without excuses, without games, without any recommendations. Just come with an honest and open heart. Jesus says, if anyone will come to me, I will in no wise cast him out. You can come to his open arms while we pray. Dear Father, we need the right kind of mediator. We need the Son of God to play His part in our lives. We need to confess to the one who understands human weakness and the one who can help us overcome that weakness. Thank you for Jesus Christ, the Savior, the High Priest, the Mediator, the one who reached all the way down here in order to take us all the way up there. We accept this Christ as Lord in our lives. Keep us honest and keep us faithful. In His name we pray. Amen. We all want answers to life's questions. We all need comfort and encouragement for our spiritual journeys. We're all looking for hope for the future. We're all together on the same planet with the same basic human needs. And God has direction for each of our lives. 
A good place to start your own spiritual journey is the It Is Written website at www.itiswritten.com. Here you'll find resources to enhance your walk with Christ. Go to the studies page and explore the Bible in three free online Bible studies. View weekly It Is Written programs through streaming online video. Catch up on shows you may have missed in the telecast archive section. View the scriptures used in the current week's program. Print out the script from a show you liked for future reference. Find out about upcoming programs and see when and on what channel It Is Written is airing in your city. Go behind the scenes and get a feel for the It Is Written production process. Be the first to find out when an event with Mark Finley or other live It Is Written programs are coming to your hometown. Get the latest It Is Written ministry news and developments. Learn more about the ministry and read the history of the show that's been impacting our world for God since 1956. It Is Written is a donor-supported nonprofit ministry. On the website, you can sign up to become an It Is Written partner and make a secure online donation to help us fulfill the Great Commission. Visit the It Is Written store and find pages of spiritual resources like videos, DVDs, audio tapes, books, music, Bible studies, and digital media products. Be confident in buying online with our secure ordering system. Have a prayer request? There's a place where you can tell us your concerns. There's so much here for you on the It Is Written website. We encourage you to make it a frequent companion on your spiritual journey. Get connected to the source that can change your world, starting with you. Join us here in Italy for the next program in this series, Faith Against the Odds. We'll hear the story of Geoffrey Vareil, who was a brilliant young priest in the Middle Ages. To really follow his heavenly father, he had to move beyond his own father's allegiance. The story shows us exactly what it was that enabled the Waldenses to keep advancing their faith against the odds. Find out how to avoid getting stuck in your past. From the green hills of Italy and the lush Waldensian valleys, keep looking to Jesus. Until next time, remember, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God.